Alright, today on Northern Ropes, I had the WBO International and WBO NABO Super Featherweight Champion with a record of 9-1-1, one, one, 7 KO straight out of D.C., Lamont Roach Jr. was good. How you doing, man? Man, talk about life growing up in Uptown D.C., man. Come on, now. Well, it was, I mean, as a kid, you know, you don't, you know, you don't really know what's what. You just, you know, out there having fun. Um, I grew up yeah. with... I want to say about six, seven of my cousins. We all went to the same elementary school, um, Gage Egerton, over there uh, around Elm Street. Uh, and we grew up, we grew up uh, at my grandma's house every day on W Street. And, um, you know, it was cool. Uh, I, I was the youngest, so I was into a lot of stuff with all my cousins. And, you know, we grew up rough and came up fighting. Um, my father had us put the girls on with each other, was fighting people in the neighborhood. So, you know, it was cool. It was fun. You know, speaking on that, going back to the age of nine, your father took you and your cousin to the gym for the first time. Talk about that experience. Well, uh, you know, that was just a one-time thing. Uh, for for me, it was one of them. So he asked me if I wanted to go to the gym, if I wanted to box, and I'm like, yeah. Ever since then, I ain't missed a day in the gym. Because during that time, you were really into football, correct? Yeah, football was my number one sport. Um, I was really good at that, you know, I was playing with a team, four zero Falcons, and, um, you know, we went to a couple of Beltway championships, we won a state championship, murder state championship, and, you know, it was really good. Was there ever a point in time that you ever thought about quitting boxing? No, not once. <laughs> uh, as I got older, I started to, you know, compare and realize, like, once I got to, once I got to high school, I was like, man, look, these high school kids, they getting bigger, and I'm out here losing weight. So I can fight. Uh, you know, I'm the best at my. I'm the best in, in the nation in my age and my weight. But it's a hundred people that's number one wherever they are in my position playing football. So it was it was a wrap when I got to high school. You know, I want to talk about your amateur career. You, you know, with your amateur breakdown, you accumulated over 100 wins, over 100 wins, 16 losses, 11 national titles. Speak on that. Uh, was was. Uh, was the uh, Olympics ever a thought during that time? Oh, of course. That was like one of the main goals, especially like um, as I was getting older. And because in our gym, we had a couple people that were shooting towards the same goal. Like um, probably the Olympics before me that I would have qualified for was 2016. Um, the Olympics before me was 2012. We had two fighters that were in the Olympic trials at our gym already. So, you know, that was me foreseeing what, you know, what my future could have been. Now, during that time, is, is it true that you, uh, that you had a fight with Tank during that time? Oh, yeah. I fought Tank twice. What was that like? It was good. I mean, it was, you know, it's competition. We grew up in the amateurs together, like, you know, because he's from Baltimore, so he's so close. Um, even though it wasn't like the regular... It was like, you know, we fight in D.C., we fight. D.C., like, that's just a different state compared to... D.C. and Prince George County, it's like a different state compared to Baltimore, even though Baltimore is the same state. Um, they, like, kind of, like, out of town when it comes to boxing. But uh, when we fight in the regional tournaments and they fight in our state, silver yeah. gloves, too. So, like, it's like we, we seen each other fight. He fought some of the same people I fought plenty of times. And we fought twice, actually. We fought in the um, J.O. tournament, in the Junior Olympics. Who won those? He won both of them. Oh, wow. But, but, they was close. They both on YouTube. So, um, you know, uh, after the first fight, we fought in Baltimore. And, of course, they wasn't going to let them lose in Baltimore. So, um, it was a good fight, though. And I think USA Boxing seen the... Uh, the tape of the fight, and it was a, it was a little controversial. So they sent me an at large at large bid to the nationals, and um, when I got to the nationals, of course he was dead because he beat me in the regional championship. We won two sides of the bracket. And we met in the championship at the nationals, and he beat me in the national championship. Now, when did you get noticed by uh, Golden Boy Promotions, and what was the deciding factor in signing with them? Um, when did I get noticed? Probably around. 2013, late 2013, after I won my uh, 
the two national, uh, the men's national tournaments that I fought in. I fought in the USA National Championship in 2013 and one outstanding fighter. And then I won the National Golden Gloves in 2013 as well at 17 years old. And um, I think my dad was telling me I was, he was, that Golden Boy was interested, Al Heyman. And um, at the time, Mike Tyson had his promotional company, so I am Mike Tyson. Um, was looking at me as well, and once he, once we talked about that, we, you know, we talked over the logistics, the business aspect, and um, we thought Golden Boy would be a perfect fit for us. Now I, I gotta ask, man, how's your experience been with Golden Boy Promotions, knowing that they're, you know, heavily uh, Hispanic, Spanish, populated fighters? How's your experience been with them? My, my experience has been good with them. Uh, you know, they treat me like family, and, and I respect them for that. They uh, put me in the right position as my career uh, grew as a fighter. Uh, they grew me into the fighter I am now. And um, that's why I'm on a world caliber, uh, that's why I'm in a world class uh, fighter like I am now. Now, going back to January 28, 2017, you captured the WBC youth silver belt with the first round KO. Talk about that and the excitement you had in getting your first belt. Man, that was that was crazy. I mean, just fighting for it. I was, you know, I was anxious. I was young, uh, so uh, fighting for a regional title was, you know, that was major to me. And um, this guy that the guy that I fought was a previous uh, world title challenger. Even though he fought like a smaller weight than me, he was moving up in the way that I fought. And um, you know, knocking him out in the first round was a big thing to like spectators, reporters, and stuff like that. So. I was happy with it. Now, I want to talk about the controversial uh, draw that you had. And with you re uh, redeeming that, um, having to fight again for that WBO title, did you want to talk about that? I mean, it is what it is. You know, you got bumps and bruises in the road. Uh, that's how the boxing world is. And, uh, that's not the first time I experienced that, but um, on a professional level, it is. You know, it's, it's sad to say. Um, I fought in Puerto Rico against a Puerto Rican kid, and um, you know, it is what it is. I knocked him down. The referee was, man, it was, it was BS. So, you know, it is what it is. I, I took it, I grew with it, and I, I, kept, I kept learning, I kept moving on. And the next fight, my next fight, I fought for that title again because I was supposed to fight him. But they didn't accept the rematch. Um, I fought Julio Boston, and I'll come up second. Now, you last fought in 2019 with a 12th round uh, decision loss to Jamel Herring. On that day, uh, he captured the WBO title at the 130. Talk about that fight and what did you learn from that loss? Um, that fight was, you know, uh, one that I always keep with me for sure. Like, even on the road, like, I, I got it with me now. Like, I learned a lot from that fight. And um, people will see in my next fight how I've grown and I've, I've gained a lot of experience from that championship fight. Did, did you, uh, one of the things that we talked about is about letting your hands go. Did you feel you didn't let your uh, hands go enough in that fight? In that fight, uh, yes, but not, nece not necessarily enough, just uh, I didn't start soon enough. And um, that's, what I, that's what I've been working on. And um, working on once I get a guy hurt, you know, just, you know, finish it. Even though when I got him hurt, um, that should have been a knockdown. But, you know, it, it, like I said, it is what it is. And, um, you know, we, we've been working on a lot of stuff, and y'all going to see it coming to play my next fight. You know, do, would you say that was your toughest opponent to date? Toughest? Toughest, I would say. Uh, I would say so. Just, uh, just being general. I had a really tough fight. Uh, my fourth fight. My fourth fight for a guy who was kind of experienced. Um, I heard him, but uh, he was he was dead. Like that was one of the fights where I learned that you ain't gonna knock everybody out. That was it was a four round fight. I got a majority decision, and even though it should have been unanimous, but it was a tough fight. You know, prior to the pandemic happening and the COVID-19, you had a scheduled bout on uh, March 19th, 2020 uh, with Neil John Tambiona? Tabadoo. Tabadoo? Uh A.K.A. The Beast, uh, with a record of 17 wins, 7 losses, and 11 KOs. How disappointed were you during that time, and how excited are you uh, to get it on again in, in August? I was very 
very disappointed when that fight got canceled because it was so close. You know what I'm saying? Like, it, I was seven days out before the fight got canceled, four pounds away from my weight. So, you know, that's a lot of sacrifice and hard work, you know, gone out the window. But, um, you know, I stayed in the gym. I didn't take a break or nothing like that. I stayed in the gym. I'm still in shape back from March. So um, I'm in better shape. And, you know, I'm just, I'm going to look like a beast for real. His name, his nickname the beast, but I'm going to look like the beast in there. What can the fans uh, expect on that night? They can, they can expect uh, me being sharp, technical as usual, but more vicious and, um, you know, more assertive. Now, just talking about that whole weight division at the 130, you know, you have uh, the WBO champion, Jamal Heron. You have the IBF champion, Jojo Diaz, WBC, Miguel uh, Bachet. You have the WBA with uh, Rene Alvarado, who's the, I guess, super champ, I guess, in the division. Uh, uh, Leo is the super champ, so, and Rene is, is the regular champ. Regular champ, and then you have Chris Colbert, who's the interim champion. Yeah. Now, uh, are they on your radar as far as? Come on, you know that. You know they are. I had eggs about that, man. All champions are on my radar, man. Um, after this fight, that's the that's all the names we're looking for. Everybody you name, um, everybody who has a championship at 130, that's who I'm looking for. Has there any uh, been any discussions about uh, rematching with uh, Jamal Heron? Um, not between the two camps, not between my promotional company heads or none of that. Uh, I'm pretty sure, like, you know, he fought me already. I don't think he would, you know, he, he won. So why we, you know, double back unless it's mandatory, you know what I'm saying? So I, I know how that goes. It's business, you know what I'm saying? So, yeah, do, do you feel right now in boxing the best fighting the best? Or is it a lot of, like you said, uh, politics of the sport where it's, it's a lot of maneuvering right it's now? It's coming. It's, it's getting there. A lot, like you've seen some of the lineups like Showtime and... Uh, Fox and all that with PBC and stuff like that. Some of those fights are uh, damn good fights. Um, Golden Boy, uh, Golden Boy is having good fights too. And uh, Top Rank, they've been coming along with good fights. I think they have better fights are to come as well. So, you know, boxing is getting there with the big fights and the big games fighting each other. So it's, it's, it's going to be good in the coming year. Now, what are your thoughts on the D.C. boxing scene? Do, do you feel the, the boxers here in our area support each other like they should? Yeah, I think so. Um, at one point it wasn't, but I, I think we do for sure. I think uh, D.C. boxing is close, close net because there's so many fighters here. But it's just like, it's so many fighters that are on the, you know, on the radar or on the national team. Uh, it's just a matter of time until some of them fighters get noticed. Uh, even though they, some of them are, or most of them are with a big promoter, they'll get there and, um, you know, it, it'll be, I, everybody inside of boxing knows that DC is a boxing hobby. Everybody, everybody inside of boxing for sure knows that. No, um, who were the fighters that you looked up to growing up? Who are the fighters that I looked to growing up? Um, from here or period? Uh, period. Because I know uh, you uh, talked about Lamont Peterson on many occasions. Yeah, I like Lamont. Lamont was one of, uh, one of the guys I really looked up to. As I, uh, when I was an amateur coming up and when I was a young professional, um, I remember when he fought me a con and I was there. You could see me. You could see me and my, uh, and my man Malik on TV. Uh, on the HBO fight, on the broadcast, the whole time we sitting there standing in the chair, cheering. We like in the third row. You can see us on the TV the whole time. And you can ask, you can ask Barry Hunter. He remember seeing me and calling me out like after the fight, like right before they announced it, pointed at me, and I was like, we got it. And he damn sure got it. We was excited. So, you know, he was one. He was definitely one of the champions that I looked up to because he showed me that you could do it, coming from nothing, um, coming from where we come from. Just it's his story a little more drastic. I, mean, I, I don't really got no story like that, you know. But his like coming from nothing and coming from the area we come from, because it's hard to come from here. And a lot of people will tell you, a lot of previous champions will tell you, a lot of people who made millions from here will tell you. In, in Boston, they will tell you that it's, it's hard to come in. It's hard, hard to come from here. So he's one of them guys who actually did it and, and did it the right way. Especially during that time when D.C. was chocolate city for real, for real. Unlike what you see now with the gentrification that's yeah. taking place. Yeah. 
you know, speaking on that, has any of the Oh, do you feel a lot of the the older champions that are from DC uh, give back and mentor to the younger fighters such as yourself? Uh, yeah, they try. They try. Um, like uh, Mark Two Shot, uh, he's in all the league. Uh, he got, I think he coached, or you know, he, he used to coach. He had his own gym. Um, him and his father, and they had their own gym. Uh, Sugar Ray Lennon, uh, he comes back every once in a while um, and comes to the gym, actually comes to our gym and speak. Um, well, Chop Chop's doing box, so but he got he got kids, he tried to teach them how to box. Um, it's a lot of champions, Lamont and Anthony, they still do their thing. Lamont, um, he recently retired from, from what I know, and I'm pretty sure he's retired. Um, he comes back and help at his gym, so it's a lot of, it's a lot of professionals that come back and help for sure. You know, speaking on, on the father-son combinations uh, in boxing, what does it mean to have your dad in, in your corner doing your fights? It means everything because uh, he's been there every step of the way. Ever since we walked in the gym to right now, um, he wasn't always my trainer. Uh, he had to learn how to become a coach. My cousin Bernard was a... Uh, was my head coach. Um, Actually, you can see right there in the background there. Yeah, right there in the background. Um, he passed away uh, due to a stroke and uh, like a heart attack. He was uh, so, you know, it was sudden and unexpected. We was in training camp for a fight um, in 2017. So, you know, it was, it was pretty sad. You know, it was like he was like another father figure to me. And that's like a, a guy that I've seen it ever since I walked in the gym, literally almost every day up until that day, because that's how that's how involved he was with us every day at the gym, every day, every day, every day, even outside the gym, tournaments, all that stuff. He he invested his time in the saving kids as a firefighter and in the gym. How does your mom feel about your boxing? Uh, she still be antsy. Even though I've been boxing forever, she still be answering, but she know she know she she know she she know what she made. She she know what I made of. She know she know I got her and my father and me. So she know I'm alright, but she still be. Is it is it hard for her to watch your fights? No, she the loudest one in it. She the loudest one in there. <laughs> Definitely. She might she might jump, man. She might be Frantic a little bit, but she know she she out there talking the most trash. Talking uh, she talking all that. Talk talk about the relationship between you and your younger brother, who's a great boxer as well. And, and what are some things you share with him about the sport of boxing and life? Uh, I just try to keep him like you know next to me, so, I mean, so he can you know come up and be better than me. I don't want him to be like me. I want him to be better than me. Uh, he surprising to say he like he my favorite fighter. I out of all fighters, professional amateur, he like he do he he get nasty in there. I ain't gonna lie, he get nasty in there. He would fight, he would go. Man, he definitely one of my favorite fighters. So I just try to you know give him game, whatever I can, you know soak up from whatever whatever experience, whatever I'm learning. I try to get him. How proud of you uh, when he got the Pigskin Awards last year? I was proud. I didn't even know he got them until they were saying. Uh, they about to leave for the Pigs and Banquet. I'm like, hey, got fight of the year and ain't tell nobody. So, you know, but that's a good accomplishment to uh, get one of the best fighters in um, the D.C. and Maryland area. What's, what's the best advice you've gotten uh, so far from your mom and dad? Uh, you know, just, just stay true to myself and continue to do what I do. You know, work hard at whatever I do. That's some of the best advice that um, they could have gave me because that's what I'm doing. That's what I'm living. Yeah, um, you know, right now I'm, I'm enjoying what I what I've had, what I put out in the world, and I'm uh, you know reaping the benefits of my hard work. You know, this question is like one of my signature questions. It's for people who might be going through tough times and adversity. Uh, what's the toughest thing that you've been through in, in your young life so far, and how did you overcome it? Uh, the toughest thing I've been through in my life is definitely uh, losing my cousin. Uh, I was I was really down. I, mean, I, was, I was down for a long time too. Uh, he's one of the most important people in my life. 
definitely. So, you know, it was hard losing him, and it was hard getting uh, adjusted to life without him. Um, How did you get through those tough times? Uh, just, you know, he instilled the passion of boxing in me. So, uh, you know, boxing has definitely helped. Uh, at the end of the day, it's, it's still my job and my career. And it's something that he, me and my dad started, me, him and my dad started. So to carry out that and you know, to accomplish the goals that we set together, that's definitely one of the things that keeps me going um, and keeps me on the upside of things. Yeah, for people that don't know, your gym is no excuse, man. Explain that to people, no excuse. That's the name they came up with. Um, my cousin Bernard, he came up with because it's at the end of the day, it's you and somebody else on the other side of the ring. There's no excuse for you know for anything. It's no excuse for what you need to get done. You know, going into your next fight, how strange will it be to have no cr- no fans, and no crowd participation? How how tough would that be for you? Yeah, it won't be tough for me at all. You gotta. Remember, we spar with people that ain't in the gym, no spectators or nothing like that. It'd be just like me and you right now, for real. So it's like, you know, it's on you and how confident you are in yourself and how comfortable you are with yourself in the ring because I don't need no fans. All I need is a box, some gloves, and a check at the end of the, at the, end of the fight. And I'm going, I'm going to whoop somebody. Now, 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 this question is here for the D.C. whole people right here, man. Who, who, who you think got the best mumble sauce in D.C.? That's tough. I don't even know. I like Andy's. I like Andy's, but I, I can't even say. I know who got the best mumble sauce in Maryland, though. Who's that? Um, the, uh, the Eddie... I think that Eddie, Eddie Lennox. The Eddie Lennox on Marlboro Pike. I've been hearing about that. Most definitely, like that. Yeah, you know, you know, my peoples and cousins and it was up there. I, we used to go to this spot called uh, Smokies on 14th Street. Okay. Right across from that uh, that bus depot, yeah. and they had some bar bubble sauce. Yeah, I, I don't know. It's, it's a it's a it's a lot of good mumble sauce in DC. I can't pick. I can't pick. I don't. It, it ain't one that stand out to me. They all good. No, but besides bubble sauce, one of the things that's DC owned is, is go go, man. Did you ever listen to Go-Go? Uh, and who's, who's your band, man? At the time when I was, like, listening to Go-Go, like, like that, like that, it was a reaction band. Right now, I still listen to, like, Backyard and um, and Clean Work for Rare Assets and stuff like that. So, you know, uh, I actually went to one of the jumps with all the old heads at, Red, at the Rare Assets show and all that. It was cool. It was crazy. But I listen to, I still listen to Go-Go when I can. Do you, you know, speaking on that, you know, with the closing of so many clubs in D.C., do you think Go-Go would die out for the next generation? No, nah, they're keeping it alive. They're trying to keep it alive. I thought at a point in time I thought it would die out. It was, it was like a low, but it's like coming back. It's coming back. People starting to get more in tune with, uh, you know, with D.C. again. Like, you know what I'm saying, especially with everything going on. Stuff they doing for the community, stuff they doing with the people for uh, for Black Lives Matter and stuff like that. It's like people coming together and some people using Go Go to start stuff up. So that's that's a good thing for us. You know, be- before we wrap things up, man, I want to talk about the 135 division because that's that's probably the next step up for you eventually in a few years, man. What's your thoughts on the 135 division right now and when what you see going on? It's that all they all they need to do is fight each other. It's one of the best divisions. It's all the, I ain't gonna lie, boxing is a good spot right now where you got a lot of good people at almost every weight. Like a lot of good champions or a lot of a lot of contenders or a lot of interim champions and all that all them belts they make up and all that. 
It's stacked. It's definitely stacked. So 135 is stacked. And they better they better stop fighting now. Because when I come up there, I'm trying, I'm trying to fight all of them too. Like as soon as I win the championship at 30, if nobody want to unify, I'm going up. Man, I, I, I got to say, man, I really appreciate your time, man. I really appreciate your uh, dad inviting me in, man, so I can check out things, man. And I know great things coming your way. Future world champion right here. And Lamont Rose Jr., be on the lookout for me. You're on the come up for real, man. Yes, sir. All right, on the ropes, we out.